G'day from Down Under, uh, everyone who's joining us from overseas. Welcome to the Australia Institute's Economics of a Pandemic webinar series. I'm Ebony Bennett. For those who don't know, uh, I'm the Deputy Director at the Institute. And the Australia Institute is one of the country's leading and most influential uh, independent think tanks, normally based in Canberra. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, everyone who's coming along today, especially Australia Institute supporters, but also those who are joining us for the first time from overseas. And I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently living, which is the UN Nation, as well as the Ngunnawal people, uh, who are the traditional owners of the land on which the Australia Institute sits in Canberra. I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, I want to thank everyone again for joining us. I know that this is uh, quite an early hour and I want to let you know that we're aiming to do these webinars at least weekly, but days and times differ. So please make sure that you're subscribed at our website, which is tai.org.au. Um, a couple of Zoom housekeeping rules uh, for everyone um, who is joining us perhaps for the first time or isn't necessarily familiar with Zoom. Please bear with us on any technical difficulties. We are all still pretty new to this. If you want to hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a Q&A function where you can type out questions for our panelists and you can also upvote the questions of other people. And please, brevity is your friend in questions. Please keep things civil in the chat. And just a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and will be posted on our website and emailed to you all after the discussion. So the Australia Institute is very privileged today to be able to bring you three distinguished guests to talk about inequality and the pandemic. Firstly, Nobel Prize laureate economist, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who's president of the Initiative for Policy Dialogue at Columbia and the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute. He's a recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences, the John Bates Clark Medal and the Sydney Peace Prize. And he's a former senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank and co-author of the recent Lancet Journal article, Why Inequality Could Spread COVID-19. Wayne Swan is the national <clears throat> Excuse me, Wayne Swan is the National President of the Australian Labor Party, former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, and the Treasurer who steered Australia through the global financial crisis without going into recession. And he's also the author of the book, The Good Fight, Six Years, Two Prime Ministers and Staring Down a Great Recession. Both Professor Stiglitz and Wayne Swan are commissioners of the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation. And Dr. Richard Dennis is the Chief Economist at the Australia Institute. He's a former associate professor at the Crawford School of Public Policy at ANU, and he's a prominent economist and public policy intellectual here in Australia, and author of several books, including Econobubble, Affluenza, Curing Affluenza, and Dead Right, How Neoliberalism Ate Itself and What Comes Next. And now uh, I'd like to introduce Wayne Swan to introduce Professor Stiglitz. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, thanks, Ebony. Uh, Joe, thanks for all your work over the years to knock over the central tenets of market fundamentalism and your advocacy uh, of a new social contract. I think we all recall very well that during the Great Recession, many advanced economies turned off their fiscal stimulus too early and they flicked the switch to austerity. And of course, those countries for years suffered very high unemployment and immense capital destruction. And as we know, that turbocharged income and wealth inequality. Now, thankfully, we didn't experience uh, that in Australia. We were the exception. And recently, our Prime Minister has said growth will magically snap back following the lifting, lifting of the lockdowns and, and the wage subsidy bailouts, which finished this September. My question is, given that uh, consumption patterns are likely to change dramatically, isn't it the case that governments will need strong, effective, medium-term stimulus to create jobs through industry policy, infrastructure investment and energy investment. And that will drive the recovery. And if we don't do that, we may well experience the Great Depression Mark II. And secondly, just with my ICRIT hat on and the good work that you do there, given that the OECD has not, ex not, not succeeded uh, in its efforts to tackle international corporate tax evasion, is it a good idea to push for a digital services tax on the global tech giants who are now making windfall profits in this pandemic. 
Great questions and great to see you, uh, Wayne. Uh, let me begin a little bit of talking about uh, the broader question that was put uh, on uh, COVID-19 and inequality uh, and put that in uh, context of the response uh, that the United States has had and how it's worked out. Um, I, I, uh, I was just joking uh, before uh, that uh, what the United States has done uh, has tried to make everybody else in the world feel good they, uh, uh, by setting uh, a very low bar. Uh, as you all know, we've been afflicted the worst. Uh, we managed it the worst. Uh, we have now uh, committed 2.7 trillion American dollars uh, to uh, the recovery measures. And in spite of that, unemployment has gone up 26 million. And the increase in the unemployment uh, is by far larger than in any other uh, advanced in any other country. Uh, and in spite of $2.7 trillion, the most vulnerable have not gotten money. And I, we hear the story every day. Uh, our unemployment insurance system is not working. Those checks, $1,200 that were supposed to go to everybody are not going to the poorest because it only got, they they won't be able to get out to the poorest until September uh, if they haven't filed tax returns in earlier years. But the poorest don't file tax returns, so in every dimension, uh, the U.S. Uh, has failed, and it's an important uh, warning uh, to others. Uh, one of the reasons why the United States has been so afflicted by uh, COVID-19 is because we are the advanced country, not only with the highest level of income and wealth inequality, but the highest level of health inequalities and a healthcare system that has not been working. Life expectancy in the United States on average ha is lower than in other advanced countries and has, since Trump became president, been on the decline. So it's lower today than it was uh, in 2015, 2014. Uh, so uh, that's the context. COVID-19 is not an equal opportunity uh, virus. Uh, it goes after those with health problems, pre-existing health conditions. And because we have so much health inequality, uh, it's been particularly uh, vicious on them. Uh, moreover, we do not have adequate protection for our workers. Uh, their bargaining power is low, that's why their wages are low, but we don't even have uh, adequate protections for the frontline workers, the people in the hospitals, the people in, uh, in the meatpacking. Uh, and the result of that is they are going to work uh, every day without protective gear, without masks, uh, getting exposed to COVID-19 and unfortunately coming down and some of them dying. So let me talk um, in, in a way, these were the preconditions into which uh, the United uh, uh, COVID-19 came to the United States. Uh, I've described very briefly the inadequacies uh, of our efforts to respond. Um, let me sort of highlight two examples of our failures and uh, the proposals that are being discussed in Congress for an alternative. Uh, the first example I want to give is where, uh, as a result of inadequate social and health policies, the disease is spreading. Uh, America has uh, the least, uh, we, we do not have any uh, mandated sick leave, and paid sick leave, and the result of that is that, particularly at the bottom, almost a third 
do not have uh, pay sick leave. And so if you come down with COVID-19, uh, the bottom 40% of America is living paycheck to paycheck, they have no choice but to go to work. Uh, now Congress recognized this as a problem and passed a law requiring mandated paid sick leave for COVID-19, just for COVID-19. But then the big companies said, we can't afford it in spite of their billions of dollars of profits. And they lobby Congress successfully and 80% of American workers are exempt from the provision of paid sick leave just for COVID-19. And of course that means that facilitates the spread and increases the death. Uh, the uh, major problem, the other major problem uh, attempt was, was to get money to uh, workers um, to, in a way that would keep them connected with the, their firms. Uh, that was viewed to be um, important, first of all, because that attachment would be very important for restarting the economy. Uh, and secondly, uh, since most workers in America depend on employer provided insurance, if they become unemployed, uh, it would put an enormous burden on uh, our public health care programs, Medicaid. Um, well, we failed. Um, it'd be too long of a story to explain all the failures, but just to mention one, uh, the, a program called PPP uh, has provided uh, uh, $650 billion dollars, billion dollars to supposedly small businesses, provided that they provide, uh, maintain employment. But it's been administered in a, a terrible way uh, through the banks. The banks were paid more than $6 billion to administer it. All they were doing is transferring electrons to the US government uh, from the applications. They weren't vetting uh, the applications. But what going through that channel meant that the banks were able to give their best customers, which were the richest customers, the ones that regularly borrow from them the most preferential treatment. And that's where the money went. It didn't go to the most vulnerable. It went to those who were best connected with our banks. And the result of this has been erratic, uh, it has not worked well. Uh, the money ran out, the first $350 billion ran out in 13 days, and we expect the second tranche uh, to run out in uh, just a few days. So the alternative proposal is to get money directly to workers. And uh, uh, there are proposals uh, in Congress to do that, that would cost a fraction of what we've been spending on PPP and be far more effective and reduce the inequality that unless we do something will be larger, greater after the crisis, after the pandemic than it was before. Let me stop there and, and uh, open up for discussion. Um, Wayne, I might throw back to you. Um, <clears throat> do you just want to outline uh, Australia's approach, and then perhaps we can have a, a chat about um, who it's who the uh, money is really getting to, both in Australia and the United States? Well, certainly in the United States, it's not getting to the average consumer. Australia has done certainly far better than the United States uh, with the. That's not saying much. <laughs> no, it's not. And that's true. Uh, but essentially, Australia doesn't have a plan beyond September. So the very big part of the stimulus put in place here is what I would call a bailout. It's the wage subsidies, a very important measure to keep connection between workers and their employee and their employers. But of course, it's not perfect. But the government doesn't seem to have any plans beyond September. And it seems to me that we're about to repeat the mistake that was made after the Great Recession, uh, 
uh, when people flip the, flip the switch from stimulus to austerity too early and the world suffered a very deep and prolonged recession. Now, that didn't happen uh, in Australia because we had a long tail on our stimulus. So really, really, Joe, the, the question is, how deep is the global recession going to be and how long are governments that are concerned with growth and with equity going to have to put in place effective, strong uh, stimulus, true investment, if you like, in, in infrastructure and energy, uh, rather than the bailouts that are working at the moment. Now, when they run out, if governments don't have that commitment to medium term stimulus, then, of course, we could be looking down the barrel uh, of the Great Depression Mark II. Yeah, I'm very concerned. Let me say that the, the, the programs that were put in place uh, were all predicated on it being a very short interruption. Two weeks, four weeks, uh, the money runs out in just a few more weeks. Uh, it was assumed that this would be what we call V-shaped, sharp down and then a sharp a bounce back. No one is thinking that there's going to be a V-shaped recovery. Uh, there's some discussion of uh, a W, that uh, a slight recovery and then uh, a second wave a little later. Uh, the concern I have is actually the way this is rolling out all over the world is that it's a, a W, but the second part of that uptick on that W isn't going to be there. So unless we do thing, do something, it'll be a little bounce back, but then a long U or L, L shaped. Uh, or bus uh, uh, What? Or bus yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, and the, the point is that it is likely to be uh, as or deeper than the Great Depression. Uh, the forecast in the United States is that uh, GDP uh, will be down by uh, 30% uh, and unemployment uh, will uh, be up to uh, 20%, may even reach depression levels of unemployment. Um, part of the problem here is that uh, when you have something as comprehensive as this COVID-19 is, you need a comprehensive response. And so we, now one particular part of this has to do with America's political structure. Um, about a third of all our public spending goes in state and local governments. They have a balanced budget framework and their revenues in 2008 went down twice that of GDP. They're already plummeting. And unless they get assistance from the federal government, since they can't print money, they can't uh, borrow, um, they will have to cut back their employment, their spending drastically. And that by itself is an, an immense dose of austerity. And that by itself will have a very negative uh, effect on our economy. Uh, Mitch McConnell, the head of Republicans in the Senate said, let the states go bankrupt. Uh, that's not going to solve uh, our economic problem. Uh, and it's going to only deepen the economic uh, downturn. Um, <coughs> designing what kind of policies are going to be effective in the medium term is going to be uh, very difficult. One of the things that uh, you did in Australia that was very good is structure the timing of the money into the economy. Uh, you designed programs that went very quickly, and then you thought about the next step beyond that. Uh, you can't have infrastructure overnight. Uh, if you want really effective infrastructure, that's going to take uh, uh, a while to plan. Uh, unfortunately, I think the reality is this downturn is not only going to be deep, it's going to be long lasting. So we ought to now be planning that infrastructure because we will need that uh, in uh, uh, six months time. Um, but there are other things that we uh, need right now, which is uh, these expenditures on social protection, education, um, the support of our basic uh, social 
and political fabric. Uh, so we have to be, when you're absolutely right, we have to be ready to have uh, a continued stimulus. And that's another point I wanna emphasize. Because we're gonna to have to be spending so much, we have to make sure that we design every program well. We can't be just giving gifts to the corporations who are doing very well. Um, we're going to have to, to address the second question you asked. We're going to have to put, impose, for instance, a tax on our monopolies, a tax on a digital tax as part of, of raising the revenue that we're going to need to be able to address this uh, very deep, and I'm afraid if we don't do anything uh, correctly, uh, very long, prolonged uh, downturn. Um, thanks, Joe. Richard, I'll come to you next, but I did just want to uh, give a shout out, I guess, to everyone joining us on this webinar. We've got uh, close to 2,000 people. So <clears throat> those from Australia, thanks for getting up early. We've got people from Brisbane, Oklahoma, Montreal in Canada. Um, so if you're joining <laughs> us today for the first time, this is the Australia Institute's Economics of a Pandemic uh, webinar series. Um, Richard, that idea of tax reform is one that's currently pretty live in Australia, but it doesn't sound much different from previous tax debates. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, sure. Um, it's interesting, Joe. In, in, in Australia, you know, we've had corporate interests pushing for, for decades to, to cut our company tax rate. We've been told for decades that if, if we do one thing to help the economy, it's, uh, it's cut the company tax rate. So no surprise, perhaps, at the minute, uh, a, a crisis the likes of which we've never seen before occurs, uh, Australians are quickly, instantly being told, well, the answer to the pandemic uh, is to cut the corporate tax rate. Uh, similarly, uh, cuts for personal income taxes for, for high income earners uh, uh, are on the table. In fact, the government's already legislated some that haven't come in yet, uh, but we're being told we, we have to hang on to those tax cuts uh, because uh, you know, when we come out of the crisis, we're going to need to give people an incentive to go back to work, as if as if mass unemployment isn't an incentive to go back to work. So uh, the question I'd like to ask, I guess, is to compare the tax cutting option to the, the, the kind of public spending infrastructure type policies you were just talking about. And, and you mentioned the need to have well-designed policies. Uh, at the Australia Institute, we've been pushing three criteria really for, for the stimulus programs. We're saying they should be laboring, the, the, the projects themselves uh, should be spent on things that are labor intensive, that have a high degree of local production and that deliver lasting benefits. And by that, of course, we mean now's a great time to invest in the kind of public infrastructure that we'll use for decades, the kind of renewable energy we'll use for decades. Uh, can, can you just talk a bit about the the, the differences, the costs and the benefits of relying on, on, on tax cuts to stimulate economic activity versus targeted government spending with, with clear criteria so that the money doesn't get squandered? Well, a, as you know, the uh, United States uh, does things bigger and better than other countries. We do inequality bigger. We, uh, 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 the $2.7 trillion uh, that didn't, not working is bigger. Um, one of the things that we did in December of 2017 had an enormous corporate tax cut. And uh, the evidence was unambiguous. Uh, it did not stimulate investment. Uh, what it did is lead to almost a trillion dollars of share buybacks. It led before the pandemic to a trillion dollar fiscal deficit. And of course, now with the pandemic, the United States, by September, the CBO, our Congressional Budget Office, estimates that the US debt GDP ratio will be 101%. Um, the, and, and that's, I believe, it, very conservative. Um, there was a very good research that was done actually in Australian data by Andrew uh, Charlton, who uh, worked uh, with you, Wayne, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, when you were uh, 
in the government. And uh, his research showed, looking at microeconomic data, that uh, lowering tax rates did not, lead, lowering the corporate tax did not lead to more investment. So I think it's pretty um, uh, unambiguous. Uh, that doesn't work. You know, what was so striking is that well, you would have thought with that huge tax cut, people, corporations would have been in a better position to withstand the pandemic. They would have taken some of that money and built up the capital buffers. They didn't. They just paid it out in dividends and, and in share buybacks, and they were actually in very fragile conditions. Uh, a company like uh, Delta Airlines paid no zero taxes, zero corporate taxes in 2018. And now we have to bail it out to the tune of billions of dollars. You know, this is, you might say, an outrageous uh, kind of situation. On the other hand, the kinds of uh, measures, investments uh, that you talk about can not only stimulate the economy, but when they're right, uh, correctly designed, go after the other, you might say, pre-existing conditions, the problems all of us have had, uh, had before. Uh, one of those problems is the huge levels of inequality in our society, much worse in the United States than in Australia, but still uh, very significant. And the second one that all over the world we face is climate change. And uh, this ought to be an occasion, you know, the government is basically channeling huge amounts of money into the economy. So this is a really an opportune time to use that money to reshape the economy, not to uh, have us save the industries that have been uh, destroying our environment, but really try to move the economy as part of the green transition. So I think uh, doing you know, the, the list of things that you talked about, things that helped increase the demand for labor, that'll increase wages, uh, things that will uh, help address the other problems our society faces like climate change uh, and that stimulate developments in Australia all of those are, are the kinds of directions that I think make a lot more sense. Um, Joe, I might ask a question if that's all right. Um, just looking at the Lancet article that you recently published uh, here in Australia, uh, we've seen the government uh, dramatically increase the amount of the social security benefit that's supplied to people who uh, are without jobs at the moment. Um, that was a recognition that it was far below the poverty line as it was. Can you speak briefly, I guess, to um, how inequality is exacerbating or perhaps uh, contributing to the spread of COVID-19 through things like insecure work and lack of, uh, uh, lack of access to things like paid leave provisions because of things like um, deregulating industrial relations and weakening the protection for workers, access to healthcare, those types of things. Uh, we're, you know, I, I, we're seeing it so clearly in the United States. I, I mentioned one uh, uh, set of examples, the fact that because people don't have paid sick leave in the United States uh, and because those at the bottom have no buffer, no, you know, basically less than $400. They are living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, if they get sick, they have to go to work if they possibly can. And if they are sick with COVID-19, they go to work and they spread the disease. Uh, in, the, in New York, they take public transportation. Again, they spread the disease. Uh, they just spread the disease uh, towards uh, the, pe the people who they interact with. A particular example where this is being uh, particularly uh, vicious is in our meatpacking industry, um, where uh, the, there are no standards for, uh, until very, very recently, no standards for health protection. People are very 
uh, close quarters, the wages are low, uh, and uh, no masks were provided. And the result of that was there have been uh, several meatpacking plants that have been devastated, uh, have been one of those centers where COVID-19 spreads uh, like a wildfire uh, 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 across uh, the, uh, the population. Um, in some places here in New York City where we have stronger unions, uh, even though government hasn't provided the protections, uh, the union for butchers, for instance, have said, our workers are not going to work unless we have masks. Uh, the, the, the stores didn't seem to mind spreading the disease, but the workers felt uh, it was wrong for them and they were being uh, exposed uh, themselves. And so they said, we're going on strike unless you give us. But in most of the country, uh, the unions are very weak and the government has failed. And so workers at the bottom without paid sick leave are being forced to go to work uh, if they're going to survive. And our, our uh, safety net that the government provides is just not working, it's not adequate. Uh, there are just tragic stories of the demand, the increases in demand in our, you might call soup kitchens, our, our voluntary system that it, it unfortunately has to serve as the backup because of the failed government. Um, uh, people are donating uh, money to these uh, kitchens, uh, uh, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of uh, meals are being donated but this should be a public responsibility. Uh, uh, we should, as a society, show solidarity for those uh, who are being afflicted. Uh, but unfortunately, our government is not responding uh, in, in that way. And uh, what, what worries me is that this crisis, as I said before, is going to worsen the inequalities uh, because it is those people at the bottom who are being affected the most, it's the people at the bottom who are losing overwhelmingly uh, jobs, uh, you know, people at the university, I can continue to teach the rest of the semester uh, on Zoom. Uh, but uh, it's, it's the people at the bottom who are disproportionately losing their jobs. Joe, just to follow up on that, in all countries are different, obviously, but uh, Australia's government says we're going to bounce back out of this really fast. Trump says it's going to bounce back very fast. The, you know, for an economy to grow fast, it, it's got to be consumer spending or business investment or exports or government. You've just spelled out why it's not going to be consumer spending. You've spelled out why it's not going to be government spending. Uh, in, in Australia, it certainly doesn't look like it's going to be exports. And I, I presume that's the same in America because every country is going through the same thing. So exactly. really, really what it sounds like everyone is assuming is that after an incredible period of disruption, capitalists are just going to feel like massively expanding their private investment. A am, am I missing something or, or is this a likely outcome? Uh, it, you know, uh, it's fantasizing on the part of Trump and probably on the part of your government. And, you know, I know the United States much better. Um, remember, he said there would only be 15 people. He, he said there, uh, when we had only 15 people that had uh, COVID-19, he said, oh, it's going to drop to zero. You'll see just overnight. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was, he somehow thinks that everything can be dealt with as a public relations uh, issue. So if he just says, you know, like a cheerleader, uh, everything's going to be fine, he thinks everything's going to be fine. The fact is uh, that virus is not listening to his rhetoric, and the economy is not listening to his rhetoric. Uh, and 
unfortunately, what I think is going to happen is that even as the pandemic gets under control, we bent the curve in the United States. The numbers are still horrendous every, every, uh, every day, but they've come down slightly from their peak. But even you know, when we start opening up, uh, there's going to be two things going on that's going to dampen everything. One, uh, balance sheets. Balance sheets of households, balance sheets of firms are going to be devastated. And secondly, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we don't know whether uh, there's going to be a second wave. We don't know whether uh, how long the immunity is going to last. We don't know whether um, when we're going to get antivirals and what, when we're going to get a vaccine. But most realistic estimates say that there is at least a significant risk that it will be months and months and months. So all this. Uh, 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 cheerleading, you know, I, I hope it's true, the, but I wouldn't count on it. And you can't plan on the basis of hope. Uh, it was the mistake that Trump made when there were only 15 cases and say, I hope it goes away, that led him to do nothing. Uh, that led him to do nothing about the shortage of masks, to do nothing about the shortages of protective gear. Uh, to do uh, nothing about uh, the shortage of tests. Um, and uh, the concern that, you know, that Wayne raised is if you're planning that we're going to have a robust recovery on its own, uh, I think that's fantasizing. Uh, you really have to plan that there's going to be, need to be a uh, long slope. You're going to have to put more money uh, in. Uh, that's why I say you have to spend your money very carefully. And if it turns out that small probability that there is that bounce back, then you don't have to spend your money, have some flexibility in it. But uh, you have to plan uh, on uh, a contingency, which is, I think, more than a 90% probability. Um, Joe, we might go to some questions now, and I've got uh, one here from Gareth Hutchins from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, and he asks, in the post-coronavirus world, do you think developed economies ought to start recalling some manufacturing activities onshore so that they're less exposed to future disasters? Well, uh, the pandemic has called into question, uh, made us rethink globalization in many dimensions. Um, I would begin in my rethinking of globalization to begin by emphasizing it's shown how the world uh, is so integrated uh, that the virus doesn't carry a passport, doesn't respect visas, is gone across the world and we needed a global response. Just like climate change is a global problem and we need a global response. But the other side uh, that, is, uh, that the question calls attention to is the fact that many developed countries, most developed countries, rely too much on supply chains that were not resilient. Uh, they were undiversified, and that meant if there's a problem in one part of the world, uh, there will be uh, a problem in the whole supply chain. But that is not an argument for going towards protectionism. Again, let me just highlight what uh, Trump has done and how dangerous it is. Uh, he's talked about putting restraints on the export of medical supplies uh, from the United States, medical material. But we import so much more than we export. And if we do that and other countries do that, we're gonna be in a much worse position. And I think all countries will be in a worse position. So what we have to do is recognize that we have to create greater resilience throughout our economy, including uh, through trade. 
but we also have to recognize that we live in uh, an integrated world, a single planet, and we have to have multilateral solutions to these problems. Um, Wayne, did you just want to add anything to that about bringing manufacturing onshore? Well, I think it's certainly demonstrated that in this country, our industrial base has been hollowed out. The closure of the car industry, for example, has left us stranded without key key skills, which we now find in a pandemic we need. There's going to be a new debate about reindustrialization uh, in Australia in the years ahead, and in particular, how we do it powered by renewable energy. We can do two, both things at once. We can, we can make our economy cleaner, we can tackle climate change, and in those areas where we have the, the skills, uh, we can reindustrialize. So this is a big challenge, not just in terms of energy policy, it's a challenge in terms of training policy. It reinforces the whole case for investing in your workforce. I mean, what this pandemic really shows is the most important asset any country has is their workforce. Um, I might go now to uh, Bruce Chapman. Do I have you on the line there, Bruce? I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. What's your question? Hi, Joe. An area of inequality. Hi, hi. An area of inequality in the U.S. that is worth recording relates to the situation with respect to the disadvantaged undertaking for-profit tertiary education, unregulated and generally very poor quality education. The situation is now much worse because of the virus recession. Most of these people have student loans which have to be paid even if they are jobless. And this ends up meaning 50% of these people default and end up in terrible situations, unable to borrow in the future. Can you comment on this issue and also help us understand, this is a big one, why are US governments so averse to sensible education regulation and where is your country now with respect to the student loan debate? Uh, you raised a, a, a very important issue uh, and uh, an aspect of the question we've been talking about of how the uh, pandemic is going to affect uh, inequality. Uh, uh, a lot of our poorest students uh, when they go to uh, schools to get basic skills uh, at the tertiary level, uh, take out student loans. Uh, and uh, we passed a bankruptcy law that I, I think of as absolutely unconscionable. Uh, President Trump uh, can go to bankruptcy court and discharge uh, his debts for his gambling casinos. But if a student borrows money to get ahead, to just, you know, get a decent life, no matter what happens, he cannot discharge that debt. Uh, and if his parents have co-signed that note, uh, his parents cannot discharge the debt. Even if the kid dies uh, from the COVID-19, they cannot discharge that debt. So, uh, and the problem that you pointed out, Bruce, is, is a very serious problem. The schools that provide this education uh, do not do a very good job. And a very large fraction of the students do not get jobs. Uh, this has been a longstanding problem. When I was in the Clinton administration, we tried to regulate uh, and we tried to say, you, you can't operate it as a, uh, a school of higher learning if you, your students don't get jobs, if they don't graduate, and you certainly can't get access to government loans. Uh, unfortunately, special interest prevailed. And these for-profit universities have become a very large special interest. And uh, the result uh, is that it's been a quarter century and we have not been able to uh, regulate. We've not been able even to deny them access uh, to student loans. And as I said before, things actually got worse when we, quote, reformed the bankruptcy law under President Bush. And we said you could not even discharge your debt in bankruptcy. Um, so the consequences for our society are enormous. It means that young people face this dilemma. 
uh, they can't afford to go to school uh, without borrowing money. So they don't go to school. They know their opportunities are very limited. Wages of those who are not college graduates have been falling dramatically. But on the other hand, if they borrow to go to school, they have this noose around their neck. Uh, it's now about $2 trillion in aggregate. So it's actually so large, it's having macroeconomic effects. Uh, so in Congress, uh, there have been proposals. Uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren have, have made uh, put forward proposals uh, for uh, uh, dealing with this student debt. Uh, I think what you've done and the income contingent loan programs that Australia has are uh, one of the ways to go. And, you know, I've been talking about uh, your, the Australia model. Uh, it's been weakened in recent years, but the Australia model is one which uh, allows access to higher education uh, without uh, the kind of burdening uh, that uh, the American system has. Uh, the alternative way is what Europe does, which is to keep tuition affordable uh, by government subsidies. But one of those two is that we have to go. And I believe the next democratic administration will go down those, one of those two routes. Um, the next question is from Jacqueline Byrne, who asks, what kind of responses must we demand from governments to consider and redress the gross disadvantage that neoliberal policies have exerted on the most vulnerable and on our environment that have been exposed by this crisis? Well, I think th this echoes, in my mind, the questions that have been previously uh, asked. Uh, the government is really coming to the rescue of our entire economy. And as it comes to the rescue, it ought to be thinking about if we're going to spend, in the United case of the United States, uh, trillions of dollars, trillions and trillions of dollars, we ought to use that money to reshape the economy to reflect our values. Uh, and uh, that means uh, reshape it in the direction towards a greener economy, reshape it in a direction towards a more uh, shared prosperity. Uh, I actually think uh, one can create a more dynamic economy. Uh, in the United States, we've underinvested in science. Uh, one of the ironies is that uh, every year uh, since he's been elected, Trump has advocated a reduction in uh, spending on science by about a third. Uh, uh, he's uh, disbanded the White House Office of Pandemics. Uh, he underfunded uh, the Centers for Disease Control. You know, all these are public investments in uh, strengthening our future, leading to higher productivity, uh, as uh, Richard and Wayne have pointed out. And uh, these are the ways in which we can have a greener and a more prosperous economy with less inequality. Uh, so I really think that uh, we ought to realize the government is bailing out our whole economy. We ought to use that money to reshape our whole economy. That's not what's been happening. Let me just say, it's not what's happening. So what's happening is just the opposite the money is going to where the lobbyists are the strongest. So the research foundations, the education institutions don't have as good lobbyists as the airlines. And so the money is going to the airlines and not going to our universities. So our future is being impaired uh, because we are not consciously thinking about where we should be going. Um, Richard, obviously uh, climate change has been a huge issue in Australia. We've touched it on it uh, a little bit, but um, uh, what would you like to yeah. add on, on climate? 
Uh, look, I mean, just hearing Joe talk about the future just then, I, I just, you know, we, we just went through catastrophic bushfires uh, over over summer, Joe, I'm sure. If the, smoke, if the smoke didn't make it to America, I'm sure the pictures <laughs> did. It's uh, yet, you know, for, for decades in Australia and America, we've been told we, we can't, uh, we, we can't invest in renewable energy. We can't have a carbon price. We can't do all the simple things that economists say would, would tackle climate change because it, quote, might hurt the economy. Well, in Australia, a conservative government has just shut down 30% of our economy, rightly so, to protect us from something. So uh, there's the issue of uh, how, what kind of investments should we make? They're pretty obvious in renewable energy. But why do you think that our political class in America, in Australia, around the world, has found it uh, so hard to respond to uh, an issue like climate change, even when in Australia, at least the Conservatives have shown they can listen to science uh, on, on COVID-19. What's going on? Well, I, you know, at one level, it's very simple. Special interest, uh, special interest uh, the mining industry, certain parts of the mining industry are very influential in Australia. They're very, the oil and coal lobbies are very influential in the United States. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're not asking what's good for the country. They're asking what's good for their pocketbook. You know, it's, it's almost that simple uh, and that crude. Um, but there's another element uh, that I, uh, call attention to sometimes call it cognitive dissonance. Um, you know, the banks were the strongest proponents of free market economics until 2008 came along. <laughs> and then they were among the most enthusiastic recipients of hundreds of billions of dollars of money. Of course, they all said it was only not because they wanted it for themselves, because it was necessary for the economy. Uh, they were willing to accept it in order for the rest of the economy to do well. Uh, and meanwhile, they paid themselves uh, some pretty good bonuses uh, in order to incentivize themselves to help the rest of the economy. Um, I think it's a very similar uh, in the current context. Uh, you know, the airlines aren't saying, oh, you know, we, we should give more money to, uh, uh, we should give less money to those companies that paid, that took the tax cut and paid out uh, big dividends and share buybacks uh, because um, they didn't do what they could have done uh, to take care of themselves. Uh, the companies believe in accountability when and only when it's convenient for them to believe in accountability. And uh, when it's not convenient, uh, they don't, uh, don't uh, talk about it. In one of my books, I call this air socks capitalism, uh, where you uh, uh, socialize the losses, but you privatize the gains. And uh, that's what we've seen. And you know, to me, it's a very strange that people have this kind of cognitive dissonance. But in behavioral economics, uh, in psychology, it's sort of a standard fare. Um, <clears throat> we're running out of time, so I'm not sure we'll get to too many other questions, but I just wanted to finish up on tax. The Australia Institute has done a lot of work on tax reforms, um, but it's a, a very live issue. And I've got a question here from Lucy Lennon about tax for international tax avoiders. I'll ask all three of you if you could try and keep your answers to about a minute. Um, Tax for international tax avoiders and tax reform in general, what should be the priorities? To you first, Joe. Well, I, I think what globalization has done has enabled the multinational uh, corporations to look around the world and uh, find uh, ways of <laughs> avoiding taxes, both in terms of where they locate, but Sometimes they don't even move. They just move where they claim their profits are uh, originate. Uh, and some of our smartest companies making some of the best products are even smarter in tax avoidance. Uh, Apple uh, became the sort of uh, uh, poster <clears throat> child where they moved. Uh, uh, they claimed that all their European profits originated 
from uh, a few hundred people working in Ireland. And when that was too embarrassing, because it got too much attention, and the European Commission said they had to pay 13 billion dollars, euros, uh, they moved the channel to, to, to uh, uh, another uh, tax haven, the Channel Islands. So uh, the, the point I'm making is that uh, we've created a framework for multinational tax avoidance. We have to close it down and the principles are very clear. The commission that Wayne and I have been working on have laid out those principles. It's not that complicated. Uh, we know what can be done. Um, it's just, again, to echo what we've said before, it's a matter of politics. Um, Wayne, I'll go to you next. We've seen um, some countries, uh, some Nordic countries, for example, refuse to give bailout money to companies offshored in, in tax havens. What's your answer to that? Well, I think that's a very good idea. The international talks have really broken down to crack down on multinational tax evasion. The most important thing to do to reinstate a social contract is to deal with the tax term termites, both internationally and nationally. So we've got to stop this race to the bottom us if we're going to have any chance of achieving the sustainable development goals. So if we want a progressive future, it's got to be based on a progressive tax system uh, where people pay according to need and which incentivizes labour and capital. And we haven't got that at all at the moment. I mean, this crisis demonstrates to me that it's good economics uh, to recognise the dignity of labour and to reward them well and not to punish them with a tax system that's regressive. And we've got a big fight ahead of us if we want to achieve the SDGs to reinstate progressive tax systems internationally and nationally. And that means using cracking down on those firms uh, that are involved in bailouts who are sending their, their super profits off to tax havens. Thanks, Wayne. And Richard? Oh, thanks, Herb. It's such an important question. I mean, you know, it's often said that tax is the price we pay to live in a civilised society. Well, the way a lot of these companies behave, it's, it's as if they don't have any interest in civilization. Um, we, we're in the middle of a debate now about self-sufficiency. Well, uh, I think neoliberalism, if it's done anything, it's, is it's made individuals and even nation states feel insecure. I think it's hard probably for Joe to understand this, but you know, people living in Australia think that if we tax Google or if we tax Facebook, maybe they'll go and they won't come back. and you know, they won't look after us anymore. And I, I think with all this talk of uh, governments wanting to step in and make our country self-sufficient, well, I actually think we need to make our country self-confident first. And uh, of course, Google and Apple will still want to sell products in Australia. They make a fortune selling stuff to us. They do in all countries. And uh, I think countries around the world just literally need to stand up for themselves and, and understand that it's a privilege to be allowed to operate in Australia and make a fortune ripping our customers off. Of course, they should pay a lot of tax. And if we charge it, they'll stick around. Um, and a final word from you, Joe. we've got one minute left. Um, what would your message be to governments like Australia um, about the best way to get out in less than a minute? What's the best way forward here uh, for a government like Australia's? Well, you know, it's going to take a, a, a very large uh, role of government. Uh, individually, we cannot attack something like a pandemic. We can't attack a problem like climate change. We have to uh, require, we require collective action. And it's going to take a lot of collective action. And that means there has to be social solidarity. And that reflects, uh, has to reflect where our vision of where we want our society to be, that's going to require progressive taxation. It's also going to entail a green transition uh, uh, and uh, real hard work to create a uh, more shared prosperity than we had before the pandemic. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for today. I want to thank specifically you, Professor Stiglitz, for joining us from New York. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne Swan and Richard Dennis as well. And thank you to all of us, uh, all of you who have joined us here today. If you uh, are unfamiliar with the Australia Institute, again, we are, one of the, we are the country's leading influential uh, 
independent think tank. You can find more of our research and analysis, including uh, our tax reform agenda at tai.org.au. And if you enjoyed today's webinar, we have another Nobel Prize laureate on next week. That's Professor Peter Doherty, uh, Nobel Laureate Professor and Immunologist. He's the patron and namesake of the Doherty Institute, and he'll be on talking about the public health response to COVID-19. That's on Tuesday, the 5th of May at 11 a.m. If you are in a position to help cover the cost of these webinars, which aren't free to put on, please donate at our website, tai.org.au, because every little bit helps. And please make sure that you're subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money, where in the latest episode, we discuss the design principles for a well-targeted economic recovery plan. And please stay home if you can, keep washing your hands and stay safe. Thank you so much for joining us to all our international friends and we'll see you all next week, hopefully. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tim.